Veterinarians of Reddit. What is one thing you wish people would know slash understand about their pet? RVT here. There are so many. 1. It is not cute or sweet to have an obese pet. It can cause joint issues and heart disease among many other things. Stop showing your love through overfeeding, especially human junk food. 2. Dogs are living creatures who need preventative medical care just like you do, and sometimes they get sick like you do. If you can't contribute the bare minimum to take care of them, maybe you should think again about owning one. 3. Get your puppy its damn distemper slash parvo vaccines. Story 2. Vaccines you get at the drugstore on the corner or the feed and tack shop are not as good or the same as the ones you get at the vet. Just because your dog is scratching its ear doesn't mean it has ear mites. Your cat is not urinating outside the box because it's a jerk, it might be, it probably has an infection. Not eating for three days while vomiting and having diarrhea is a huge deal. That 5 pound chihuahua or even 80 pound lab can't lose that many fluids without having any intake. And you couldn't either. Story 3. Not a vet, but a disgruntled former pet store employee. Don't ever work in one. You will lose faith in humanity so frickin' fast. 1. Animals are living things, not house or yard decorations. They need food and space and attention and medical care, just like you do. It doesn't matter if it's just a blank dollar hamster, lizard, fish, whatever. If you can't afford these things, don't get the frickin' animal. 2. Animals need way more space than what's currently suggested by stores. A betta fish needs a 10 plus gallon tank. Living in puddles is a myth. And any tank less than 10 gallons is cruel and abusive. A hamster or mouse needs at least a 36 by 24 inch habitat. As deep as you can find. With plenty of extra bedding for burrowing. KT cages are extremely inhumane. Birds need large cages and should not be confined to them for the majority of the day. Rabbits and guinea pigs need a crap ton of space. To the point that a moderately sized bedroom is only adequate. Etc, etc, etc. Very few of these animals are domesticated. Especially birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. And their needs should be matched as closely to their wild counterparts as possible. 3. Do. Your. Research. You should never ever rely on a pet store employee for anything more than is X species in stock? Some stores admittedly go above and beyond with their pet care department training, but most do not. My store gave me no training at all, and I spent many hours researching what we sold to be able to sell to customers responsibly. Many fish in the trade are schooling, and need 6 to 12 plus more of the same fish to feel safe and unstressed. Water temperature and pH is frickin' important. You can't just throw whatever fish you want together. Most reptiles and a lot of amphibians are solitary, as are hamsters, which means you must buy another habitat if you want more than one. The effects of cohabbing range from stressed to death. Having a bird is like having a goddamn child in terms of their neediness. Hermit crabs are a massive commitment. They are social, require large spaces, and precise humidity, temperature, and diet, or they frickin' dehydrate and die. 4. Please understand what food your animal eats before you bring it home. You cannot feed a cat dog food. You can't feed a rabbit hamster food. And you shouldn't be feeding any reptile or amphibian the prepackaged stuff from the store. The more exotic the animal, the more likely you'll have to feed it fresh or live food. If you don't want to touch worms or crickets or dead mice, don't get an animal that eats them. 5. Stop getting mad at your animal for acting like an animal. Cats need to scratch. Dogs bark. And all animals bite and scratch when they feel threatened. My cat makes the most annoying frickin' sound when she plays. But she's having a good time with her toys. And it's not for me to take that away from her. If you don't like barking, don't get a dog. If you can't be bothered to take five seconds of your life to teach your cat to use a scratcher over your furniture, don't get a cat. If you absolutely need to be able to cuddle your animals, don't get reptiles, fish, amphibians, or some species of birds. Learn what the animal does. The sounds it makes, the way they play, the way they demand attention from humans. And if you don't like it, pick a different animal. 6. Animals get stressed. I used to have customers laugh at me when I said this. Animals get mega stressed when their needs aren't met. And stress is one of, if not the biggest ender of non-dog slash cat pets. Animals get stressed if they don't have enough cover, if they're a social animal and are kept alone, if they're solitary but are kept in a group, if their habitats are too small, if their temperature, humidity, or pH is wrong, if their food is wrong for their species, if they're handled too much, etc. Stress leads to a weakened immune system, illness, and death and is 100% preventable with a little research. 7. If you own a pet and it's not a bird slash mammal, it doesn't love you. Not the way you're thinking of love, at least. Reptiles, amphibians, and fish don't produce serotonin the way mammals and some birds do. They really don't care about you. They don't want to be snuggled. They don't want to be your friend. And it doesn't make a difference to them if you feed them slash do their maintenance or someone else does. Yes, they can learn to recognize you as their primary caregiver. My axolotls all know who I am and swim up to the glass if I'm there, which they don't do with anyone else. And they may come to trust you, which is arguably more valuable than love, but we don't know enough about them to say that they can love you. We just know that they can't love you the way you love them. Their biological 
biologically incapable of it. That's not a bad thing, just different. 8. Anthropomorphizing your pets will probably end them. Your snake is not lonely in its habitat, and does not want to be pulled from it to hang out. Your salamander's not hiding 24-7 because it's shy. Your cat is not peeing on your bed because it's mad at you. Your rabbit doesn't chew cords because it likes the chewy plastic coating. Simply do not apply human emotions to your pets like that. They are not human, and they do not experience the world like we do. Your snake is a solitary animal. Look, don't touch that wants to be left alone in its warm habitat. Your salamander is probably hiding because you didn't put enough enrichment. Caves, other hiding places, plants. Your cat is probably peeing on your bed because it's sick and definitely needs to go to the vet. And your rabbit chews cords because that's what rabbits freaking do. So hide the damn things when you let it run around. 9. Hamster balls are terrifying and border on inhumane. How would you like to be trapped in a poorly ventilated ball hardly bigger than you are with no control over its direction or understanding of how to gain control, and at the mercy of large predators that likely see you as a toy? Most hamsters pee while they're in them too, so they're in a poorly ventilated uncontrollable ball that reeks of pee until you put them back in their cage. 10. Turtles slash tortoises live for frickin' ever and require an obscene amount of space and fresh food, not feeder fish which are kept in terrible overcrowded conditions and prone to parasites because of it. 11. Fish do not grow to the size of the tank. Fish grow to the size of their species. Imagine that as a baby, your parents never bought you new shoes, and at five years old, you're still wearing the tiny cute sneakers you wore at 12 months. Did your feet just stop growing between years one through five? No. Your feet kept growing, and crammed into those tiny shoes, they likely grew extremely deformed and very, very painfully. The same thing happens to fish. It's called stunting their growth, and is regarded as abusive and inhumane when we do it to literally any other animal, including humans. So, don't do it to fish. 12. Because I know someone will ask. Why do companies manufacture and sell items that are bad or dangerous or inhumane for the animals they're labeled for? The simple answer is, because people keep buying them. Pet care and comfort, even for dogs and cats, wasn't something most people really cared about until the late 90s. Experts and dedicated longtime hobbyists now understand that most of what we used to know was good for animals is actually bad. Remember how everyone used to give their dogs rawhide bones, and now we know those bones are prone to splintering and injuring the dogs and are mostly glue? Seriously, boil one, you'll melt it. Bones shouldn't do that. Or how everyone used to feed their cats friskies or meow mix, and now we know those foods are mostly fillers and complete crap. The same sort of epiphanies happen in the exotics hobbies, but manufacturers don't care, and are still producing the same crap they were 5 and 10 and 20 years ago, and retailers are selling it, because of the popular opinion that the farther away from dog and cat and animal, the more they can count on a customer's lack of knowledge. These are the same people that would pay you nothing to work for them if they were legally able to, remember. They don't care about you or your pet, they care about money. Plus, if your pet dies, you have to come back and buy a new one. It's in their best interest to ingrain mistreating animals. They don't want you to buy a goldfish that lives for 10 plus years. Yes, well cared for goldfish are supposed to live that long, by the way. They want your goldfish to get sick so they can sell you a crap ton of medicine that likely isn't even for what's wrong with it, and then it still dies. Also, you can buy another one and justify buying a new goldfish from the supplier. Do we even need the rest of this thread? I feel like OP just threw down absolutely everything. What a colossal post. Touching on every point is just gonna bore you guys, and I'm not gonna do that. But one thing I did want to say, I totally thought they're growing to the size of the tank thing was real. No, we are just constricting them, like a weird foot binding thing, as OP said. Makes me very uncomfortable to think about when I think about it like that. So, OP, mission accomplished. Story 4. RVT here. Exotic animals, reptiles, birds, small mammals such as rabbits, hamsters, guinea pigs, and rodents may be easy to acquire and assumingly easier to take care of, but most of these animals have very specific housing and dietary needs that need to be met and require enrichment. Also, not every veterinarian has experience with exotic animals, and exotic animal medicine is sometimes at a premium, but is still necessary. I've met a lot of people who get a small mammal or a small bird for like $20 from the pet store, and then won't pay for medical care because it costs way more than the pet was purchased for. Story 5. The internet is not a place for you to self-diagnose and treat your pet. I saw way too many things happen to pets that didn't need to, like putting oregano or oil in your dog's ear to treat an ear infection, or water, or letting your other dog lick its ears clean. Giant dogs and little dogs are both expensive, but giant breeds require more quantities of meds if needed. Be aware of common ailments for your breed. No, you don't need your pet to produce a litter once. They don't care if they have one or not. For the love of all that is holy, stop using chain and extending leashes, please. Don't let your dog loose into the clinic either, or your children. We are babysitters. We cry with you when you lose your pet. We take every loss with us. If you aren't there during the procedure, we are still holding them close, petting them, and talking to them the whole time. 
And if your dog is super stressed or can be nippy, let us know before we begin the exam. A muzzle is safer for everyone involved if it's needed. If you get a puppy, touch them everywhere all the time. Lightly restrain, lift up and down onto different surfaces, get them used to noises. It will make the vet a better experience for them. The best time to get pet insurance is when they're young, before anything has happened. If you do, read your policy. If you don't understand something, ask questions. There will be a waiting period before your pet's coverage starts, so you can't get pet insurance the day of and have it be covered. Vets don't get a bonus or reward for selling prescription dog food. They have them so they can aid in the treatment of whatever your pet is dealing with. Those are the companies doing the research to create specialized diets. And until more holistic brands do, that's what we have out there. Be nice to vets and their staff. Vets have one of the highest rates of ending their own lives out of any profession. Techs don't do it for the money. They usually aren't paid well enough, and the average time a person stays in the career is only five years. Oh, yeah, please don't bring your cat in a bag of dog food. If you don't have a carrier, the vet can probably lend you one. Or bring the cat in a pillowcase. Edit. I'm getting quite a few comments on here, so to address them, here we go. When it comes to dogs cleaning each other's ears, adding moisture to their ears like that is setting them up for infections if they don't already have one. Typically, yeast can be sweet tasting, so it's good to pay attention to that. It's hard because it will look clean and like there isn't an infection, but that's not necessarily the case. If they're constant about it, look for redness and thickened skin in the ear. A dog's ear flap should be tan-colored if slightly pink, and soft and smooth. Smell it. If it's sour, you most likely have a problem. In regards to chain leashes and retractable leashes, retractable leashes are straight-up dangerous for everyone. They are usually cheaply made. So if your dog suddenly sprints at something or someone, they either hit the end of the line and can injure themselves or snap the leash. You have zero control over a dog that suddenly sprints when he can just rip the leash along. People panic and get their fingers caught up in them, which can result in fractures, degloving, and even amputation. They're a tripping hazard, especially indoors. The plastic handle makes a scary loud noise if it's dragging behind a nervous dog, can cause rope burn on your pet, etc. Sure, use it on the trail where contact with others is limited, or if you have a very well-trained dog. But do not bring that damn thing to the clinic, please. Chain leashes are just very abrasive. I get that some dogs chew through leashes, and I'm sure that owners are taking the steps to correct that action. But dear lord, they destroy hands, and again lead to situations where you have less control. They're painful if a dog wraps around you. They're abrasive as well. Took a chunk out of the clinic wall when a dog sprinted around a corner wearing one. They're also added weight to your dog's neck. Speaking of, chain slip leads should only be used by professionals who have experience with them, and with very little weight. Most people don't, which is good. There are some leashes out there that are chain wrapped in nylon, so you get the strength of the chain for dogs who chew leashes, but give you the opportunity to grab something other than the handle. Unless you like your skin being ripped off your hand, or perhaps a bitter spray on the leash. I wonder what the crossover is between people who would look up medical advice for themselves and people who would look up medical advice for their pets is. I feel like there probably aren't a whole lot of people who are like, oh no, I would never self-diagnose or anything, but my pet, sure. But maybe I'm wrong on that. Maybe there are a ton of people. I personally wouldn't, but I'm also not a pet owner. But as OP said, don't self-diagnose yourself or for your pet. If you're really worried about something, take them to a professional. Story 6. I'm a vet. 99% of patients are okay with the drop-off appointments due to COVID. The number of clients claiming, my pet has severe anxiety, I can't believe you're making him go in alone, is quite high. Almost all pets are fine, and the ones who aren't fine I've allowed owners in the building to help. There's only been two since March who actually were in distress, despite people complaining daily about it being an issue. Also, I think people need to learn more about the medical process in general. Tests are usually required to make a diagnosis. Sometimes even with tests, the diagnosis is gray. Sometimes spending all the money will not guarantee success. Many times, there's not a magic shot I can give to fix it. Story 7. RVT, not vet here. Just because you can't afford your pet's medical care does not mean we are horrible people for not treating it for free. Vet's offices are not non-profit. Your pet's wellness is your responsibility. Quit laying the blame on us when you can't or won't pay for needed care. We love your pet, even when they hate us. We honestly try to make them feel safe and comfortable, but what we have to do is scary and sometimes hurts. We don't think of you as less of an owner when your pet is upset or gets aggressive. Please, please tell us if your pet has been known to bite, freak, or scratch at the vets. Seriously. I'm still gonna love and care for him, but now I have the needed info to keep me and the rest of the staff safe. Anesthesia is dangerous. Routine procedures are still risky. We do everything we can to keep your pet safe, but sometimes bad things happen. As your pet gets older, we need to see them more often. We're better able to help normal aging issues if we catch them early, so yes, blood work and exams are super important in older pets. Fat pets are not cute, they're unhealthy. One of my sayings is, 
If this pet was as skinny as it is fat, we would call animal control. You are your pet's advocate. We trust that you know your pets best. So if you think something is wrong, be the advocate. We need to hear you. Don't send your 16-year-old with your pet if they have no idea what's going on and no way to reach you. Same goes for spouses. Most states have laws requiring a valid patient-slash-owner-slash-doctor relationship before prescribing medications. So no, we can't refill your pet's ear medicine if we haven't seen them in two years. Even if you say he's having the exact same symptoms. Vets can lose their licenses. Please don't be mad at your five-hour wait time at the animal ER. Be glad your pet is a lower priority. Triage isn't a game you want to win. We will happily take care of your pet's broken toenail once we stabilize the dog in heart failure, stop the puppy dropped on its head from seizing, and sew up the dog that got attacked by its housemate. I know, waiting sucks, and to you, your dog is the most important. But we aren't sitting around doing nothing while you wait. We are trying to save the life of someone else's best friend. And so much more. I really, really love my job and the amazing pets and owners I'm privileged to work with every day. We're a team. We want to work with you within your budget and a level of comfort to provide the best possible care for your best friend. My hope is that you want the same thing, to be on the same team. What a great singular sentence in here. Triage isn't a game you want to win. That is so true, OP. I feel like, for normal ER, that is also a good thing to keep in mind. I'm surprised to hear OP really driving home the point of they love your pet too. I thought that was kind of implied, but I guess if it's a scary experience for the pet, then it can be a scary experience for the owner. I, it makes sense, kind of. But yes, even in medical care for yourself, and then also your pet, you and the medical professionals should always be working on the same team. If it feels like you aren't, there's something wrong there. Story 8. Vet here. Here's my best advice condensed. 1. Thin pets live longer than fat pets. Google a BCS chart and make sure your pet has a visible waist and palpable ribs. No crash diets. 2. Dental disease is way more serious than you think. Get the scale and polish. If we have to extract teeth, and believe me, we would prefer not to, they will still be able to eat. 3. Get your pet a series of Cartrophin, or Zydax, or Pentasan polysulfate injections when they turn 8. They help slow down the progression of arthritis and are safe and cost-effective. 4. If your cat is stressed at the vet, take home some gabapentin to put on her food before her next visit. She will be safe, happy, and calm, and the vet will be able to examine her more thoroughly. 5. Know what's toxic for your pet. Definitely don't have lilies in the house if you have a cat. 6. Discuss finances. Your vet wants what's best for your pet and is obligated to recommend all your best options. But if you tell us what you can afford, we can usually work with it. 7. You deserve a vet you can trust. If you don't trust yours, find one you do. 8. Put your 24-hour ER vet's address into your Google Maps slash GPS favorites so you don't have to find it in an emergency. 9. High-quality kibble is fine unless your vet tells you otherwise. 10. You can almost definitely give your cat a pill. Ask us for tricks. 11. Be nice. We're human and we all care intensely. Even if we hate you, we probably love your pet. Story 9. UK vet student here and been in the industry for a few years as an assistant. Here's my list. We are not out for your money. An average vet salary in the UK is 30 to 35k. If I was out for money, I would have become a human doctor instead. We make things as cheap as we possibly can. Please, get insurance, open a savings account, be prepared. On the note of insurance, it does not work the same as your car or home insurance. Do your research. The only policy worth having is a lifetime policy, and take out cover for more than you think you'll need. An average surgery for a cruciate ligament rupture will cost you in excess of £2,000. A simple cesarean is about the same. Diagnostics and bloods are hella expensive too. Hundreds for blood tests, thousands for MRI or CT. I would not take out a policy for under 5000 at least, personally. Very little of this money goes into our own pockets. Research the company as well. Some are far more reluctant and slow to pay out than others. Often you'll have to front the cost yourself and then claim back on insurance. If you can't afford insurance, open a savings account. Prevention is safer, cheaper, easier, and generally much nicer than cure. If you can afford to buy the £2,000 dog, you should be able to afford its upkeep. Do your research on the breed, what to expect and what it'll cost. Pets are not a one-time cost or purchase. Pets are a privilege, not a right. Snorting isn't cute, it's a breathing problem. A nail trim is not an emergency unless you have been neglectful enough to let them literally curl around and are now cutting into your pets, probably infected. We know more than your breeder does, trust us. We are trying to help you. It might not fit your or their narrative, but sadly, the truth isn't always what you want to hear. Brush their teeth. Insurance companies never pay out for dentals and poor oral health in later life can shorten lifespan. 
Natural remedies that have been proven to work are called medicine. You've heard of penicillin, I'm sure. Your older pet probably has arthritis, and arthritis hurts. Make comfortable changes. Squishy beds, short walks, a ramp or steps for heights. We also provide pain relief. Your female pet absolutely does not want just one litter. You do. We have enough homeless pets in the world, but if you're gonna do it, be responsible and do it properly. But we would also rather you left it to the professional breeders. Very few pets actually have peaceful deaths at home. They often suffer beforehand. Pay attention to your pet as they age. Keep in regular contact with your vets and nurses. And when the time comes and you have to make a difficult decision, know that outside of COVID times, many vets offer home visits. Insurance will often cover cremation costs, and it can all be planned in advance to make it easier on you and please be brave and stay with your pet. It would be so much better for them. There are loads more, but you know, we do this job because we care. Story 10. What anxiety actually looks like in animals, especially dogs, and how unfair it is. People don't know that yawning, side eye, lip licking, constant paw licking, etc. are signs of anxiety. That is your animal trying to speak to you and their surroundings that they aren't okay. Over time it can escalate when they aren't heard, up to biting. And the only way I can really intervene as a vet is some behavioral therapy, but mostly through lifelong meds. Many clients hate giving anxiety meds because it's a daily commitment and or they don't believe it's a big deal. They don't think that their animal feels anxiety because they perceive the animal to have a good life. And what they do is just a quirk. Furthermore, if they stop some of the meds, the animal will be chemically resistant when you try to use them again, like Prozac. Animals can't really go to a therapist like we can, but it's also unfair to let them live in states of extreme anxiety. Think of those moments when you have a situation or no obvious trigger that you feel your stomach drop, you can't focus, and you have that sense of impending doom you can't shake. Animals feel that too. Oh, also don't get me started on behavior misinformation. Dominance slash alpha theory, ignoring your animal when you come home slash leave, purposefully switching up your routine so they can't tell you're leaving, all BS. Now I'm wondering what pet therapy would even look like. They can't really talk about their problems. I guess it's just meds? That's rough, man. Anxiety in humans is already tough. As a creature that cannot really communicate their needs, that's brutal. Story 11. Not a veterinarian, but I am a veterinary assistant. What people often think is an emergency really isn't. And your pet will not die that night if we can't squeeze you in for a same-day appointment. For example, if your dog has a minor ear infection, it's not going to die if we tell you that our earliest appointment is next week, and that we don't have any more available slots for the current day. Especially not when we're about to close in an hour. We had a client with a GS insist that her dog needed to be seen now because it was an absolute emergency and her dog was completely 100% non-ambulatory, and that she, the dog, would need to be carried into the hospital via a stretcher. Doctor agreed to squeeze her dog in for an appointment during his lunchtime. And guess what? The dog was walking fine. Our doctor didn't even find anything significant, even with radiographs. Story 12. Not a vet. Just someone who would have been screwed if not for savings. If you can't afford pet insurance, see if you can afford half or even a quarter. Save that half or quarter in a bank account or save for something and do not touch it. That is your pet's emergency fund. No, an emergency is not, but that toy looks so cool my pet would love it. An emergency is, some evil jerk kids let my pet out and he got hit by a car. An emergency is, I had to adopt my pet at four weeks old because he was in an unsafe environment and his eyes were underdeveloped. So he got conjunctivitis, which turned into a deadly infection, and he needed antibiotics for almost two months. An emergency is also, my car broke down, now I can't afford my pet's vaccines. But it's fine, I have the emergency fund, haha. -ha. Vaccines matter. The only reason my dog is alive is because I had 600 pounds in savings I could use on him when emergency scenario A happened. As for B, I didn't have a fund for the guy yet, but at least I could afford his treatment, which wasn't too expensive anyway. Save anything you can. Even five dollars, whatever, a week. I think your pet's life is more important than your pretentious and overpriced Saturday Starbucks drink, so if you have to give that up to save, so be it. Am I thinking of a specific jerk who chose Starbucks over a cat that died because the owner wasn't prepared? Mm, yeah, I am. Story 13. Ex-Vet Tech. Dogs and pancreatitis. It can happen by eating the wrong food once, and it can end an otherwise healthy dog within two or three days. For the love of God, do not feed your dog table food. One intake of the wrong food can potentially cause pancreatitis. Most people think that we rarely do it, so it's okay to sneak some sausage to their dog during dinner. No, no, no. One time can trigger it, and it can be extremely deadly. Also hand in hand with this, if your dog isn't eating or drinking water, it needs medical attention. Don't wait a few days. It will get dehydrated and it may die. I just know, a lot of you are going to be in the comments being like, but my dog or whatever eats table food all the time and it's fine. Like, sure, but you still shouldn't. You're still running a risk every time you do it, is basically what OP is saying, I think. So just don't, or I don't know. 
I was gonna say or be careful, but I don't think OP would have liked me saying that. I think they would prefer I just leave it at don't. Story 14. Amavet. Please be nicer to us. I assure you, I don't earn enough for the abuse to be worth it. I studied so hard for this. I've been fighting chronic burnout. It affects my personal life greatly. All I want to do is help you and your animal. There is no Medicare for animals, and yes, healthcare is that expensive. Preventative medicine is encouraged to prevent bigger bills later, so please factor that into your budget when you acquire an animal. Just providing a home isn't good enough. Denying adequate medical care is a form of suffering. When I ask you questions about diet and worming history, etc., I'm not judging you. I just want answers to help me reach diagnosis. Consider an annual blood test in your middle-aged animal to help us pick up disease early. Please tell me if your dog might bite me before we begin the consult. Don't be offended if I want a muzzle. Some anxious dogs are better behaved without their owners in the room. So don't be offended if we need to do procedures out in the treatment room. Retractable leashes are BS. Apple cider vinegar doesn't do crap. Don't put it in your dog's ears, eyes, mouth, feet, whatever. Just please come see me instead. Google is great, but it's not a doctor. <laughs> Just come see me. Vomiting all day long isn't a wait and see. Please come see me. Eyes can go from bad to worse in under 24 hours. Put the chamomile tea down and... For the last time, please just come see me. Don't stop antibiotics before the course is finished and don't stop giving the pain medication because they didn't look like they were in pain anymore. If I don't call you back right away with results or to follow up on a question, I haven't forgotten about you. I'm trying my best. COVID has seen us have massive increase in business and everything takes longer. Consult times are booked in 15 or 30 minute blocks. If your dog has 16 issues, I won't be able to address all of them in one visit. You don't like it when I run late, so don't make me late for everyone else. We will address as much as we can and we may need rechecks. Don't wait for the consult to be finished before mentioning you'd like me to clip your dog's nails. And a tip for non-24-hour emergency clinics. If you think your pet needs emergency care and you call the veterinary after hours line at 3 a.m. and you agree to the fees and we organize to meet at the clinic, don't call me back in 20 minutes and cancel or no-show. Would you expect to be available all night, answer calls, get out of bed, drive into work, and just not get paid because the client decided to not show? You've woken me up, probably got a consult over the phone, and many times I direct you to business hours if I can to save you money. I don't get paid for that, so if you agree to come in, please follow through. I hope this doesn't have a negative tone. I really do love when you come in with a problem and I can help you solve it and provide a great experience for your animal. We are all on the same team here, guys. That is our last story for today. And that might be a good thing because, whew, the stress in this thread was palpable. We've read full-on, like, ER ones on this channel that were way less stressful. Vets are passionate and it shows. And horrendously underpaid, which I knew before going into this, but I hate being reminded of it. These people are working real hard, so I would like to echo what they're saying and just be like, yeah, be kind to them. They're really doing their best. It just seems like a lot of them want you to work with them as opposed to against them. Which is super fair. They're just trying to help your pet, man. And also something that I didn't expect to learn from this thread. Buy your pet's insurance. I knew healthcare was important for a pet, but insurance really never factored into it in my brain. Because I've never owned one, probably. But, hey, now I know. I won't be caught off guard by that in the future when I hopefully do own a pet one day. Anyway, for now, thank you everybody so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day or night wherever you are. If you have a pet, say hi to them for me. And I will see you in the next one.